everybody? This is Matt Moreno, obviously. I'm sitting here talking with Wally Bressler. Phone sales secrets is his business. Um, he's coached how many people? Like over 35,000 people, something like that? I've done about 40,000 calls. I've, I've coached thousands of people. Like if you, yeah. can, if you can take into consideration, you know, groups and individuals and stuff like that, it's right. definitely, definitely in the many thousands for sure. It's like 22 years, so... I get, a, I get a few people under my belt for sure. That's amazing. You know, when I first saw you, I was doing the NAEA training here at EXP. Ooh, nice. And, uh, you know, I learned a ton of stuff from you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I really that. appreciated it. Yeah. Um, Funny story. More people know me by voice than they do by face. Because, really? Well, because, you know, we did coaching. We did live calls three days a week. You know, we did gotcha. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We live calls. I did all my coaching calls. So people would say that they knew me, but they'd only heard me. They never seen me, which probably is to their benefit anyway. But anyway, I kid, I kid. So yeah, so no, I've, uh, I've worked with a lot of folks. I've had a lot of folks, and I appreciate the kind of words. You know, NAEA really has uh, made a huge difference in a lot of real estate agents' lives for sure. Yeah, you know, it's, I mean, it's a huge thing for us over here at EXP. Mm -hmm. uh, we all go through the training, and I, I keep going back to it, just mm -hmm. stay fresh on it. I mean, it. There can never be enough training. No, no I, I agree. Well. I agree. But, you know, if, the thing is, is, you know, you, you ever seen those people who are like lifetime students? They have like three bachelors, three masters, like yeah. three doctorate degrees, and they, they don't really apply anything to it. I mean, you right. can get all the training in the world, but if you don't take it and implement it so you get used from it, it's just it's really just more knowledge. And knowledge, you know, knowledge is power, yeah, but really the use of that knowledge is truly what the power is, you know? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you 100%. You know, I... uh I have a lot of friends like that where they're just constantly, it's like they collect documents, you know, like they collect degrees and they're all on the walls of their house and they're all super proud of them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they, they work at Target or something like that. And you're like, don't know if you made the mess, most out of that, you know, sounds like, sounds like a commitment issue to me, sir, but that's just me. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one thing that we've been running into a lot in our office and I've been noticing with agents mm -hmm. and it kind of like been trying to wrap my head around phone call reluctance. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I never really had I was never really reluctant to make phone calls like right. with my my work history. When I started out in sales back in the late 90s, I worked at a cemetery doing cold calls out of a phone book mm -hmm. to try to set pre-planning uh, appointments. Right. To. Mm -hmm. To pedal plots, headstones, plots, yeah. caskets, all of that, you know, and sell it to the people before they die. So <laughs> you're going through the phone book looking up, you know, names of like Eunice and Fred and stuff like that, mm -hmm. making those calls. And so for me, calling about a real estate transaction is a uh, super easy in comparison. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But what I've noticed is nobody else is like me, right? Like nobody else had that that experience and and so where do you think the reluctance comes from so actually i i, I know where it comes from so i'm actually can uh, i can tell you in detail so you know i actually suffer from call reluctance for 10 years myself so okay. from 18 19 until about 29 30 you know when i got my real estate license but so here's the thing there's really two types of sales call reluctance there's a there's a syntax type of call reluctance and there's an actually an, an emotionally driven call reluctance. And so when I syntax, when I say syntax, I mean knowing what to do, when to do it and how to do it. Right. A lot of folks get into sales. And so 80 percent of new salespeople, especially in the real estate industry, have sales call reluctance. Right. But a lot of that is driven by I don't know who to call, what to say when I get there, what value I add and what happens next. Gotcha. And so that uncertainty, that lack of clarity, you know, lack of clarity is a motivation killer anyway. It's a momentum killer, right? But if I don't know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, if I don't know what to say, that can cause call reluctance. But that can be overcome with practice. That's overcome by getting on the phone, role playing, you know, and you know, or getting on the phone and calling, role playing, practicing scripts and dialogues by yourself, you know, understanding the process, and then just actually getting on the phone and getting your teeth kicked in and saying, get over, right? So that's yeah, that's how you did it, right? You got on the phone. Right. And you, by the way, if you're gonna call somebody who needs a plot. Someone named Eunice probably does because that person is probably very old anyway. Yeah. Just no, that, I'm being I was in the training, Larry. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. But, you know, Eunice, that, that person's probably older anyway with that name. Yeah. I digress. So there's that's their kind of call reluctance. And that's for folks who are just, you know, usually getting started 
a little overwhelmed by things, don't know what to do. So the syntax, the order in which to do things is a challenge for them, okay? However, the kind of call reluctance that most people suffer from is an emotionally driven sales call reluctance, okay? And so this is going to take me a minute to kind of connect the dots here. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, if that's okay, to help out. So, Absolutely, no, do it. So here's – anyway, so I'm going to tell you a story about – one of my clients first. So there's an EXP agent, an icon agent. The last two years, his name is Brian O'Neill. Actually, just left being a firefighter. Uh, he was full time. He's in uh, in South Carolina, and uh, Greenville. And you know, he he literally he's a ta- he's a tattooed agent. That's how he's branded himself. He's got like right. He's got totally tribal tattoos up his arms. He's got right. hair bald. I mean, he looks like he could kill you. Super <laughs> nice guy, though, right? But now this guy's been a firefighter for over 20 years. Yeah. And he, you know, this guy walks in and out of burning buildings. You know what I'm right. saying? Like, you know, saves people's lives on the sidewalk. So we put together our uh, our plan. I was coaching him, and I said, okay, it's time to get on the phone. He goes, I don't make calls. I like, what do you mean you don't make calls? Oh. Goes, I'm, I'm, afraid, <laughs> I'm afraid of the phone. He goes, oh, so wait a second. Like, you you save people. You go back into burning buildings. You save their, their lives on the sidewalk. You can't pick up the phone. He's like, damn. And so, you know, and I'll finish this story in a second. But so I looked at my own life at the time, and I said, okay, like, what was it that kept me from getting on the phone? And, and so I started thinking about it. And so, you know, I've, I've had, a, a you know, a, a lot of self-inflicted wounds, but a lot of other wounds that were inflicted by other people, you know. I, you know, and, you know, my parents, you know, they were good people. They just weren't good parents. You know, I had a binge eating disorder since I was age six. You know, one of my punishments when I was a kid was you'd be sent to bed without dinner. When you're like three, four, five years old, that created a lot of fear of being hungry in me. And so... Right. I was sexually abused when I was 10. Um, I had, you know, I started looking at pornography when I was 11. I started having sex regularly when I was 12. And then, you know, I, I was bullied, you know, horribly till I was like 13, 14 years old. So by the time I was 14, I had an addiction to sex, an addiction to pornography, an addiction to food. And then, you know, really an issue with money, too, because we grew up poor and had a real poverty consciousness. You know what I'm saying? And then from the time I was 14 on, instead of having things happen to me, I was really, I went through like a long, like probably 35, almost 40 year path of self-destruction. So, you know, ruined my marriage by being unfaithful to my ex-wife four times. I probably wasted about $55 million of my life, ruined lots of friendships and relationships. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, I went to federal prison for a year. My, my business partner back in 05 and 06, we were doing uh, real estate investing. He lied on $15 million with the mortgages. And so, you know, I was part of it. My name was on paperwork. I had, you know, there were things I looked the other way on. And so, but I had to accept responsibility for making a bad decision. So I spent a year in federal prison. You know, I didn't get to see my family for a year. My my fault. And then when I got out of prison, a year after prison, I met somebody. And I really wanted the relationship to work. It was super toxic. And I just looked past all the red flags. And I found out about four and a half years later when I couldn't get this person to come move down to be in Texas with me, even after she had accepted an engagement ring from me, that she had lied to me about everything she'd ever told me and the fact that she actually had never left her husband. Oh, and so wow. she was still married the whole time we were together. And so, you know, that was literally like the, the last horrible decision and a long list of bad decisions. And, you know, yeah. and I, about a month after I found that, I, I decided I wanted to take my own life. And so fortunately I didn't, you know, God had a big hand in that. But the fact of the matter is, is that, what I learned was, is that when we go through things as a child and we have trauma mm-hmm. or if we have, you know, if we're bullied, you know, if you had sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, um, you know, if you were bullied, if you had alcoholic parents, you had parents that, you know, believe it or not, parents who don't fight is bad for us because we don't learn how to deal with conflict gotcha. or we don't, we don't know how to learn how to deal with, um, you know, um, what we would consider to be a confrontation. Parents right. who fight all the time is bad, you know. And, uh, you know, you get a parent that, you know, your parents split up and you get a stepmother or stepfather that's this horrible person. I mean, there's so many things can happen, a near-death experience, like things like uh, I had a client who wore dress shoes to gym class one day. And uh, she was in fifth grade. The kids made fun of her forever. And she became a perfectionist because she didn't want people to see her as being less than, you know. And so the problem is, is these things happen when we're younger and then it gets planted like a little seedling in our subconscious. And then... Every time we avoid that situation, that's going to create that that pain, Matt. It reinforces in us that we don't want to do those things where we're going to feel rejected, right. where we're going to feel not liked, where we're going to feel confrontation, where we're you know, and so it just kills our self esteem. And so it grows from <laughs> seedling to a little plant, to a big plant, to a bush, to a big bush, to a tree. And by the time we're in our 30s, 40s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, we've got this big sequoia tree of avoidance where we're going to avoid anything we need to do to make sure that that pain doesn't come up in us again, right? right. 
So it has nothing to do with the phone and everything to do with approval and acceptance and, and low self-esteem and fear of rejection. Does that make sense? It does. Right? It and, does. It, and it's a complete, it's a, for some people, it's a block. For some people, they get sweaty pits, they get sweaty, you know, sweaty face, they get sweaty hands, dry mouth. Right. Some people just completely check out. You may, if you, you know, you've been owning your team for a while, you've been owning, you've owned your team for a while. You may have some getting ready to get ready people, the over preparers. Yeah. Right. And my presentation needs to be good. My scripts need to be good. My, you know, I don't look good. Um, you know, and, but people who are in complete denial about it, you know, people who say, oh, they don't want me. They don't need me. It's too late to call. It's too early to call. I don't like cold calling. I don't want people like when people call me every excuse in the book, you know? Right. And so what happens is it shows up as call reluctance, but really what it is is, you know, I've got these hidden identities about what I believe I can and can't do and who I am and who I'm not. Yeah. And those th things trigger an avoidance strategy, a procrastination, perfectionism, you know what I'm saying? And then yeah. what happens is I just don't get on the phone. Right. Right. Does that make sense? Makes sense. And so anyway, getting back to Brian, you know, we started working with Brian and, you know, we, we, we figured out some things that happened and, you know, he's like, geez, I'm a firefighter. I can do these things. I'm a firefighter. I should be able to get on the phone. Yeah. And so, about four weeks after we started working together, he calls me. He says, hey, I just picked up a $500 list, $500,000 list. And I go, really? Let's go. Goes, yeah. I said, where'd you get it? He goes, I was calling Fizbo's. I was like, huh? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. what? And the guy ended up having another like half a million dollar house to sort of sell. So the whole yeah. point is, is in working with Brian and looking at what I did to overcome my own sales car reluctance, like, you know, I, I, I really worked on, that's why I created phone sales secrets to help people yeah. identify, be aware of what it is that was causing that car reluctance and then taking them through a process. And I'm not selling anything, but taking people through a process. Right. And the reason I'm sharing that with you is you're not stuck with it. You know? Yeah. That makes sense. You know, because, you know, essentially our, our, our sympathetic nervous system, our fight or flight instinct gets triggered when something bad happens. Right. And you're either a fighter. So like you look at guys like Frank Shamrock, you know, Frank Shamrock is no, he's a UFC fighter. They're going to oh. train with Ken Shamrock and he basically spent his life kicking the crap out of people. Oh, and they made a business of beating people up through UFC. Right. Yeah. He was used when he was a kid. He's like, I'm never going to let you hurt me again. He was a fighter. Yeah. But for folks like me and who other folks have phone sales reluctance, something triggered that fight or flight response and they became a runner. They became yeah. a leader. And so, and then they just reinforce it for the rest of their life. And it could be something as simple as your parents not fighting or somebody telling you that yeah. you were big or you took something that somebody said and you turned it into this I'm not good enough thing and you did it your entire life. This and it's a total self-esteem issue. 100% self-worth and self-esteem issue. And most people yeah. don't even realize that. And here's the thing. Like, we all have different levels of self-esteem in different areas. Like, I'm never right. going to be, I would, I would, if somebody said, hey, put on a tutu and do some ballet, my self-esteem is probably about here, right? <laughs> you know, probably not going to happen. No, no, no. You want me to cook you dinner, help you with your sales? Like, it's up here. So it's not yeah. just, it doesn't mean we lack self-esteem everywhere. Right. It just means we have self-esteem issues in that area. And so... What happens is, is 40% of existing sales uh, people um, have call reluctance and 65% of all sales people have a very strong need to be liked. Not want to be liked, but need to be mm. liked, you know? Right. Now, does not make these people bad? Does not make these people lazy? I don't believe in laziness. I think laziness is just another word for I'm scared and yeah. I don't know how to deal with it, so I'm just going to check out. Right. And, but once you go and find out where that is, that reason is that that happened, you can make it all go away. And so it's really just a redirection, right? Like, yes, you know, like that, that seed of fear is not going away. That's, well, that's in there ingrained in the psychology, right? And we just have to redirect that to be able to get through, break through that wall or what? So good, good, good question. So I would say the difference between, and this, you know, they say, the difference between really successful people and unsuccessful people is that really successful people are willing to go through that fear. They're willing to march through that fear. Right. So when we say redirect, here's what I mean is, is like, like well, well, I have people, and I just, my first thing I do is I help people, awareness is, is your biggest friend in helping you solve any problem, right? Yeah. Why am I not, you know, successful on the phone? Well, let's listen to what you're saying, and maybe that's why you need to fix it, right? But awareness is your biggest friend in solving a problem. So mm -hmm. let's go find out what the problem is. So let's just say that, um, you were bullied through grade school and right. you had terrible self-esteem, right? You know, we get acceptance, usually or approval in two places when we're growing up home and school, because that's where you spend most of our time. Right. Exactly. So let's just say you were bullied and the kids in school treated you like crap. They beat you up. Your self-esteem, your belief in yourself is going to be low. Your need for approval is going to be high. You know, you're not going to feel good about who you are and you're not going to put yourself in a position where you're not going to be approved of sure. because in the past it was horrible for you. So far, so good. Yep. So we go back and I say, hey, listen, I tell people, go take a couple of index cards, two five by seven index cards, 
and just write down on it what is the source of my call reluctance or what is the source of my procrastination or what is the source of my perfectionism, right? Because whatever it is, it's all the same thing. And usually by the end of the next day, people are telling me what it's for. So now we know that it's a need for approval. It's a need for rejection, right? Right. So the redirect comes not so much from, I don't, you know, I'm not going to need approval anymore. What it comes from is, is now I'm going to make sure that every time that that feeling comes up where I feel like I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to go ahead and deal with that feeling and let it go out. Mm. So rather than just falling prey to it, you know, like I'm now a guardian at the door of my mind and we're not going to let those, I'm not, we're not going to not feel the emotions. We need to feel them. We're just going to process them. Does that make sense? It does. So, so T. Harv Eker says, you know, he's a, he's a personal development expert from Canada. He calls it TFAR, thoughts, feelings, actions, results. Right. We get a thought, then there's an emotion that comes up. Then I take action or inaction, which is still an action. And then I get a result. But if you are an addict or if you're a procrastinator or if you have call reluctance or you're a perfectionist, you've got imposter syndrome, you go thought, I'm just going to ignore this procrastination, perfectionism, drug, oh. sex. I just completely gloss over that emotion because yeah. I don't want to feel it. So what I teach people is to do is say, okay, let's get that. Let's let that feeling comes up. But when you feel the emotion, instead of freaking out, let's just go ahead and become mindful. Let's just focus on being present and let that feeling come up and pass. Mm. Right. And when you do, when you, when you take control of that emotion and realize it's not going to kill you when you spend five minutes processing it, eventually it goes away. Yeah. Now that's part of it. The other part of it is reprogramming my brain and, and getting into affirmations. And I use Hal Elrod's miracle morning as my, right. as my brain transformation strategy because it's perfect. Mm. So we change, we get affirmations in it. And I, I, and people say, you know, if you're, if you're a, if you're, let's, if you're a perfectionist, you know, you would read a book like, um, you know, um, the gifts of imperfection by Brene Brown, or imper- the imperfect you. And if you're, uh, if you have need for, if, you know, if you, if you feel like you're not good enough, we go read "You're a Badass." Or mm-hmm. I have to read a book that's pretty much counter to what they're thinking. And then we work on practicing mindfulness. You, know, Mike, you good? <clears throat> yeah. All right, good. So don't be, don't be dying on your podcast. I, I, <coughs> so wrong pipe. Put down the wrong pipe. Yep. Tell you what, that, that, that epiglottis really does work. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, so, you know, we're read from, from, and then to your point, like we're redirecting our thoughts. We're redirecting what we say about ourselves. We're redirecting how we feel about ourselves. We're taking control of those emotions and we're self-regulating and we're not letting those emotions come in and take root. And I've had people within two weeks start picking up the phone and making phone calls because they can control those emotions. <coughs> right. Yeah, right. Awesome. Two weeks. Usually it's eight weeks. But the whole point is, is once you decide that you're not going to let your fears take over and you learn how right. to control those fears when they come up, all bets are off. That's it. And there's there's no holding them back. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's it. I'm, I'm telling you, once, it's like, once you're over it, you're over it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And here, and here's the great thing about it, Matt, is I'm not teaching people. And guys, I'm not here to sell anything. I'm just trying to help people understand the process. So. I teach one of the things I teach people is to, to use a strategy they've been using our whole life. We've been talking to ourselves our whole life. Yeah. Right? We've been processing emotions our whole life, you know, but through neuroplasticity, we can change what we believe about ourselves. We can sh- change what we're saying about ourselves. We've been saying stuff all our lives. Let's just control what we say to ourselves. Right. We control, we, you know, and here's the thing like, you know, think about this when we're a kid. Our brains are like little savings accounts. Anybody can make a deposit. You're dumb, you're stupid, you're poor, yeah. you're ugly. Nobody has teaches us how to how to remove that, right? So we got to learn how to take those thoughts out and change what's going on. And it's but the good news is it's all stuff we've already done our entire lives, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So does that does that help understand? It's a matter of un- identifying what's causing the call reluctance, and being radically honest with ourselves and saying, okay, this is the issue, and then taking radical responsibility. that issue and accepting the fact yes. that it's not going to kill us, and that it's not your fault. <clears throat> Right. Right. Anybody else call reluctance? It's not your fault. Right. Something happened in New York City that you saw something and made a decision or you were bullied or you were abused somehow or, you know, your parents didn't have a good relationship or they didn't fight. or You get smacked on the head on the way out the door and said, hey, you know, listen, Moreno, nothing good ever happens to the Moreno men. So don't try anything, right. you know, or your mom is to, like a woman is to a daughter. Listen, don't trust anybody because you can't trust anybody or whatever. And then that just gets reinforced for 12, 13 years, and then it's over. So, yeah. you know, and that, but it's then once you, once you say, hey, this is, this is where it comes, it's, you, I swear to God, when people find out what the cause of it is, there's like two reactions. They're like, oh my God, I can't believe it's that. And a lot of people cry. 
And then they're like, oh my God, there's hope. Like, I don't have to like I don't have to do this anymore. And then they start seeing where it's impacted them their entire life. And then they're off and running. So, and then I wonder what else, you know, that positively affects in their life. Moving uh, forward. How about everything? Their relationships, right. you know, their family, their business, you yeah. know, people, people start sleeping better. Right. They're triggered less by things. Business seems to come out of the woodwork, which it doesn't. It just means they're right. doing the things they need to right. do. And it changes everything. It's it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. And it's it's really interesting to, to learn about. You know, yeah. as far as yeah. it's the way our, our human mind works, you know, how it's programmed, mm -hmm. how it mm -hmm. acts mm -hmm. and reacts to everything. Right, like, right. <clears throat> you know. I, would say, I would say the most interesting thing is that people don't realize that their call reluctance has zero to do with the phone. Right. It has everything to do with an experience or a number of experiences and What's in between here is the most right. powerful thing. Right. right? Mm -hmm. and, and then the, uh, and the meanings you gave it, right? Yeah. I mean, I used to be afraid to go on live video. Mm -hmm. You know? Same when, thing. Uh, when, do you know Steve McCarthy mm -hmm. from here? Yeah. So he's my sponsor for EXP. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I remember when I first came over, we we're at a listing of mine. Mm -hmm. And he was like, all right. Now that you're living uncomfortable, Matt, let's uh, let's hop on and do some live video. I was like, oh, no, 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 I don't know about it. Daddy, don't, Daddy doesn't play that. Daddy don't play that, that, don't that game, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he didn't care. He just pushed live on his phone. Mm -hmm. He was like, hey, we're live, you know, at Matt Moreno's new listing over here on 123 This Street. You know, I was like, oh, no. You know, all this stuff went through my head like, what did he just do? Did he just take my career? Like, how, you know, all these weird thoughts about what people are going to think came mm -hmm. crashing down. And then I uh, realized moments after that that nobody really cared uh, about anything. Mm -hmm. And the house ended up selling fast. And at that point, you know, we'd been on the market for a while trying to do it mm -hmm. that way. And then. Mm -hmm. The McCarthy's helped out, obviously. Sure, and, uh, sure. They got, they got my career going. Yeah, uh, sure. Mm -hmm. But you know, I was, I was totally done before I met them. So yeah, and I, but I, I and that's amazing, and that's I think that's one of the great things about EXP is you've got leaders at all levels who can grab you by the hand and say, "Listen, you know what? There is a better way. You know, let me guide you. Let me take you through what yeah. you need." And I think EXP has resuscitated a lot of people's careers for sure. There's no question. Oh about yeah, it. absolutely. You know. You know and, and, it has to do with the people at EXP. 100%. Yeah, 100%. 100%. 100%. So it, it, to your point, you know, you didn't have call reluctance, so you probably didn't have video reluctance. You probably just weren't sure of what to do. Yeah. Or, you know, and there are people that have call reluctance but don't have video reluctance, and there's people that have video reluctance but don't have call reluctance. And so it really comes down to, you know, what the what the cause is, you know what I'm saying, but you can overcome right. it. All. But as a, as a leader in the office, you know, I, I see people all the time that I mean, their walls are just up, and it's it's really interesting to hear what you spoke about today too, because mm -hmm. it's going to make it a little easier to kind of have a conversation with them about yeah. what's going on with why don't you pick up your phone? You called mm -hmm. your your friend a second ago. Why can't you call these people? Yep. Now you know, we know why. Now we know why. But also, mm -hmm. I think a big part of it is, uh, like you said, some people just need to know what to do. Mm -hmm. Need yeah. to know what to say, yeah. you know. And I'm telling people all the time, like you can't just read a script. You have to internalize it. It has mm -hmm. to be in your vernacular. It has to come across as you, mm -hmm. uh, unapologetically you. You know, they. That just, you have to practice in order to get better at things. Right, and so let, let's let's talk about that for a second in terms of, um, you know, the whole emotional call reluctance issue, right? Right. If if my call reluctance, which is usually due to some sort of self worth issue. My call reluctance is 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 rooted in that, which it usually is. I'm not going to do the things that I need to do to get better at something like right. that. In a sense, so there'll be no amount of role playing, no amount of internalization of scripts, no amount of anything that I'm going to do or be willing to do to make that happen because I don't even want to get on the phone. I don't believe I'm worth it. Right. Does that make sense? You know, the same reason that people don't get on the phone is the same reason that people don't keep a time block calendar. Is the same reason right. that people don't go to the gym. Is the same people that, reach, that people don't keep a diet. Is the same people that pe reason people have bad relationships. Is that 
it's when I, if I if I don't believe that I'm worth it, it's the same reason people stay up at night because they can't process what's going on. It's it's if I don't think I'm worth it, if I don't believe that I'm worth it, I'm not going to do anything for it. You know, I like in you know a lot of people come to call reluctant solutions. Oh, you need to have scripts. You need to be enthusiastic. You need to know what you're supposed to say when you're supposed to say. Really, right. that's like telling somebody, "Here's how you frost the cake without teaching them how to bake a cake." <laughs> right. Right. But here, here's how you frost the cake. But I've never made a cake. Oh, but here's how you frost it. Right. If yeah. you make the cake, doesn't matter how much I tell you. If I can, if you can't produce a cake for yourself, telling you how to frost nothing it, to frost. Yeah. Right. So I can't. I can't tell you all the how to, how to talk to people and what to do. And people are all worried about their listing presentation and learning how to right. do it's a transaction and and get an offer together and show houses and that's all great. But if you can't get in front of somebody, that's all useless. Right. You know, Bottom line is, if you can't have a conversation with another human right. being, then yeah, and you're so not going to get in that door. Yeah, exactly. And so, for your team member, this is where the empathy comes in, right? Like you've got to be empathetic and understand, and and and, and be right. soft on the person and hard on the problem. Like this is not your fault. Sure. And anybody who's watching this, except for the people that are trying to get us private dating chat with girls, <laughs> except for those people who popped onto your stream art and giving those nice comments. So, everybody who's watching this and has been watching and has called reluctance. There's a very strong possibility that um, that they've already realized or they've already come to the conclusion as to where their car reluctance is from because you know your brain's interesting. It's programmed to answer questions. It's programmed to look for things, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So anyway, I love how people spam like a real estate. Uh, I know. So it, it's just it happens. I anyway. just confirmed. Huh? Yeah. I just, well, I, just I just saw it and I'm like, wait a second, I'm single. I I like to date. And maybe like, okay. <laughs> so the whole point is, is I digress. But the whole point is, is you know, once you start thinking about it, it just your brain just starts going. You know, yeah. And I, like you know, when I talk to people, I start talking. I can see them go back in their head. I can see the wheels turning, and their brain already starts looking for for what the solution is. And then once you know it, you can't unknow it. Once you see it, yeah. You can't unsee it. There's only one piece of bad news here. It's not going away on its own. Mm. Even if I identify it, even if I say, hey, this is when I got beat up at school every day for a year, for five years, yeah. no amount of, and I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian, I believe in God, but no amount of prayer, no amount of begging, no amount of, of anything else is going to make it go away. You got to go do the work. Yeah. So one thing that I, I want to kind of segue into a little bit of uh, objection handling. Sure. I know that I mean, you're amazing at that. Um, Thank you. One thing that we've been hearing a lot lately is uh, I just want to see where the market is going. I just want to see where it goes before I sure. go to that next level. So handling any objection, especially in a market like this, is kind of a two-pronged approach or two-pronged. Uh, yeah, two -pronged. You have to know what's going on in the market. You need to be an expert. We talk about this all the time. You know, one of the reasons that uh, NEA got so good at helping people with their business is because we started in 2008. Right. Right, the Titanic had already taken on, taken on water. You know what I'm saying? We were already on our way down. So people needed to learn how to survive and thrive in a market like this. And one of the things we, we really did, that we really uh, made people do is this, you got to become an expert. Like you, you need to know what's happening with mortgage rates. You need to know what's happening with prices and homes. You need to know what's happening in the economy. Like you need to understand nationally, regionally, and locally, everything that's going to impact people in their market. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, on the Lark, I went back to... Um, 1955 and looked at home prices actually since 1953. Guess how many huge dips there have ever been in the, in the market since 1953? How many? One. One. The Great, the great Recession. In yeah. fact, you can go back to the dot-com bubble. You can go back to the double dip recession in 1991. You can go to the worst recession in 1982 prior to the recession. You can go to, um, what do you call it? Uh, you can go to um, uh, covid Nothing like that has ever caused what happened with that with that huge. It was in the beginning. The problem is that was created by the real estate market. That's why it was so bad because it was right. a real estate market that created that. So what you need to be able to explain to people is say, listen, you know what? Home prices don't go up and down like they did during the Great Recession and like they did after the pandemic. If you go from February 2022, July of 2022, the market nationally increased 32 percent. Right, the case right. the S and P case Shiller index shows a 32% increase in home prices. So, but you need to be able to articulate to people that you need to look at something like Altos Research and look at the fact that new things coming on the market are you know on 10 to 15 percent lower than those that are on the market. You need to let people know that you know on average half the homes in any given market have been reduced in price. 
You need to let people know that median and average time on market has gone up. You need to let people know that it's a seller's market, but only because there's less inventory right now. You know what I'm saying? And right. so you've got to be able to understand absorption rates. So you can say to people, so when somebody says, hey, I want to make, wait and see what the market does, okay, great. Right. First thing you want to know is what your timing, what your motivation is, right? If you're just out there kicking tires as a seller or a buyer, then there's no reason to have a conversation with these people. Yeah. We want three things. If I'm going to have a long conversation with you, you need to be buying or selling in less than 90 days. Yes. Right. You've got to have a, a life event, a, a death, a birth, a job, transfer, wedding, divorce, you got to have some sort of an event that's got like some actual teeth to it. Yeah. And lastly, you got to be able to perform. You either have to have equity in your house, which virtually everybody does, or if you're buying, you have to be able to get financing and have cash or both. So that's the first thing I do before I even get to there. Because if you're not, if you don't meet all three of those criteria, there's no sense in handling that objection. Right. right? Now, if somebody's saying, I want to wait until to see what happens with the market. So, you know, with any good phone handling objection, you want to repeat it. So basically what I'm hearing is you think you're going to want to wait to buy a home, right? And then you want to cushion it. You're like, okay, that makes complete sense. Or it's perfectly reasonable that you'd want to see that you want to wait. It makes sense to me. Right. And you got to peel back the layers of the ending. So when you say you want to wait, what are you waiting for? Right. Yeah. Are you waiting for home prices to go down? Are you, I mean, go up and go down. Are you waiting for, for interest rates to go down? Are you waiting to save more money? Are you waiting for your credit to get better? Right, we got to find the problem we're trying to solve. We want to isolate it, right? Right. Right. So let's just say at this point, most people are like, hey, you know, I, I just I think I want to wait for home prices to go down. Or I want to wait for interest rates to go down or both. Okay, listen, that's, you know, hey, listen, it makes complete sense. You want that to happen. So here's the deal. I follow the real estate market and I follow the, the mortgage rate market pretty consistently. Yeah. For now, home prices have settled and it's highly unlikely that they're going to go down a bunch over the next couple of years. In addition to that, we're expecting interest rates to continue to go up probably through the end of this year and even the next year. All right. So you waiting, not knowing what's going to happen, could actually cost you, uh, you know, cost you a lot of money when buying a home. Does that make sense? Right. But what I'm really hearing here is that you want a good deal. Is that right? Because that's really what they want. Buyers, yes. they want selection and price. So what I'm hearing is you really want a good deal, right? Okay, great. Well, look, if we can find you the perfect home with the perfect price and we can get you a monthly home payment, that works with your current budget, would you be open to looking to see if there were some homes that met your criteria? Yeah. Invariably, they're, they're going to say yes, right? Right. Now, can I find that home? I don't know. But look, 50% of the homes in any market have been reduced in price. A very strong possibility that that <laughs> right. Happen, right? Yeah. And then we've got mortgage buy-downs, maybe a point buy-downs, There's all kinds of things that can happen. But until I get you in front of me, I can't do any of this over the phone. So it's, hey, listen, right. if I can find you the perfect home at the perfect price, and we can get you a monthly payment that worked within your budget with the house that's out there today. Would you be willing to look now? Yeah. If they say yes, oh, happy day. Right. If they say no, then what will happen? What would have to happen in order for you to buy to move mm. to buy a house now? Right. And that's it. You know what I'm saying? So it's 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 repeat their objection back to them, and then cushion it, and then you peel back the layers of the onion and get deal, get deal, get the deal, get the deal, find out what right. the problem you're solving, and then if I could, would you? Yeah, and then if you can't solve it, obviously don't waste a whole lot of your time. No, no. and listen, here's you know, your, time yeah. to move on to the next one. How long have you been in the business now? Me? I've been a realtor for going on six years. How many people over the last six years who weren't motivated to buy a home went out and bought a home with you? Who weren't? Yeah. Zero. Zero. Right. right. So there's no sense in twisting somebody's arm or, you know, you hear these stories about, oh, they said they were going to wait. And the next thing you know, I called them and they bought a house. I'm not sure that happens. You know, sure. but if you if you if you take somebody's temperature and you get the timing and the motivation right. right and they absolutely are not willing after you've asked three or four times to move forward, they're probably not going to buy a home. And you taking them out is not going to make their motivation go so high that they're going to run out and go buy a home through you. Now, should yeah. you be nurturing these opportunities? Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Right. Because. The average internet driven lead, I mean, most almost every lead source except for referrals converts at a rate of one to three percent. Buyer yeah. leads, seller leads, expires with drawings for sale by owner, it doesn't matter, it's one to three percent. A nurtured lead creates it converts at a rate of eight percent. Yeah. So it's to your benefit. But yeah, so that's what I would do with everything. You can plug any objection into that formula I gave you. That's awesome. All right. And then and then yeah. it's just, you know, okay, and we'll just let's do another one. Like, hey, listen, I, you know, I'm uh what's another one here? Like uh let's say sellers, you know, hey, listen, you know, we're gonna, you know, we, we you want to wait until my home price is gone. Okay. Yeah. So, so what I'm saying is, you know, you want to get home prices go up. That makes sense. Hey, look, it's perfectly reasonable that you want to wait for home prices to go up. Let me ask, like, how much do you want them to go up? Like, how high do you want them to go? Yeah. Well, you know, I, geez, we, you know, we, we've noticed that the market settled. We want them to go back up. I mean, how much are you looking for? Yeah, oh, you know, 100 you know, grand. They want, yeah, they want 100 grand. Okay. Listen, I can appreciate that. 
as an agent, I would love for them to go up 100 grand. Yeah. So, but here, here, here's the thing. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but home prices have already gone up about 30 percent over the last two years. Yeah. Yes, they've settled. To, they've settled to them, but you're up from where you were when you bought your house five, house five or six years ago. Does that make sense? Right. How you know, and then you you know how long do you think you can wait to sell your home until home prices go up like that again? It could be three, four, five, six years. Do you really want to wait that long? Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask if I can find a buyer who's going to pay your price and close at a time acceptable to you. Mm-hmm. Would you be open to go ahead and put your home on the market now, knowing that you didn't have to sell it if we didn't find that buyer? Yeah. Right. 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 And then, you know the whole point is we just want to get in the house and we want to because think of show me is always better than tell me. Yeah. You know, I know we talk fast, so you guys are gonna have to like you know point five this instead of one exit like you would on auto. <laughs> you have to slow it down. I talk fast. I apologize, but show me is better than tell me. I can't get anybody to make the decision to buy a home until I can sit down and show them why waiting would be bad. Right. I can't get anybody to list their home with me until I can sit down with them and say, listen, you know what? Home prices have come down ten percent, but they're you're up forty percent since then, and it, it took you know it could take another couple of years until we get that ten percent back. Yeah, it's about but, setting the appointment, right? Like that's it, because interest rates are probably going to go up again, and keep home prices down, because mm-hmm. demand is going to be down because the number of buyers out there who can afford your home is less right. because of interest rates. So, but I can't have this conversation. I can't bring up charts. I can't do, you know, go over stuff over the phone. So I just got to get in the house. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. you can do whatever you want, legally, ethically, and morally, to get in the door with somebody to go then have the conversation with them based yeah. on hey, am I moving in 90 days or less? Do right. I have equity in my home, which almost everybody does? And is there a life event? Am I going somewhere? Like if I'm just – there's the days of tire kicking are way over. Yeah. The days of shooting for the lights and shooting the lights out are way over. The days of, of, hey, listen, if I could, you know, no. Like people have to be moving in order for yeah. you to want to be with them. If they're not willing to do – they're not moving. If something's not happening, you can't waste your time. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that was awesome. Okay, cool. Thanks. So I wanted to talk a little bit. I know that uh, you just came out with your book. I did. A couple months ago, I think. Yeah, may I show it? Yeah, absolutely. It sure. Yeah. It's showing up at my house either today or tomorrow. Oh, nice. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah, so it's uh, it's called Tragic Hero. And uh, yeah. it's kind of like part memoir, part uh, personal development book. And uh, basically, it's it's uh, it's how I overcame a life of self-destruction, pretty much. And yeah. How by looking at, you know, what happened when I was younger and, you know, I talk about radical honesty, radical transparency and radical responsibility. Like, you know, you got to be transparent with yourself and say, listen, you know what? I'm not living the life that I want and I can't take it anymore. I mean, I literally met. I remember um, I was laying in bed. It was probably I'm trying to think here. It was like December of 2020. I was laying in bed. And. I was like, I, I didn't even want to, I can't do this anymore. I like, I literally, the pain was so much, you know, I decided that I'd want to live, but I just, I couldn't, I just couldn't do it anymore. You know, mm-hmm. um, no probably December of 19, forgive me. So it was like December of 19 and I was in so much pain. Like, I just cannot do this anymore. And I'm like, I got to get help. But it took me, I went and saw a psychiatrist and hired a bunch of people. It took me until July of the next year to find somebody who was able to meet me. Her name is Kelly. She saved my life. But, you know, it took me, you know, almost eight months to figure it out, you know. But once I started working on myself and doing the things I needed to, I was, it was shocked at even how much even six months of work changed my life, you know. Wow. But yeah. if you don't, I'm telling you, if you don't do the work, nothing's going to change. If you keep selling 12, 10, 12, 10, 9, 12 houses every year and nothing changes, you've got to change. You've got to make the change, right? Yeah. If you keep dating, you know, here's this is the thing about relationships. I mean, you've been married for a while, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Good for you. You found the right person. You guys work it out. But there's lots of people that keep dating the same person. It's just that each person is taller, shorter, fatter, <laughs> wealthier, blonde hair, brown hair. But it's the same problem, right? Like right. if you keep running into the same people, you keep getting into the same relationships. If you keep running into the same problems, if you keep running out of money. Like it's 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 you. you got to fix Somewhere it. Somewhere inside, yeah. That's it. If you don't fix it, it's never going to change. And my, you know, my, my mission here is I w- it took me 45 years, mm. 45 years. It took me 45 out of the 50. From, it's been a couple of years, but basically it took me 45 years to make the decision to do what I needed to do to fix everything. And I don't want people to wait 45 years so, to do that. You know what I'm saying? 
I do. I, I've ruined millions of not millions. I ruined tons of relationships. People who I've been friends with for 25, 30 years that no longer talk to me. You know, unfortunately, I've got a great relationship with my ex-wife, but I ruined that relationship. You know, my kids. You know, I one of my kids wouldn't talk to me for months after I got home from prison. Like, you know, I I, I mean, I left prison in 2014, in September 6, 2014. I left prison with 54 cents to my name. Dang. I had to sleep in Jay Kinder's, you know, uh, guest room. I yeah. bought this car. And people at church had to give me give me money and give me clothes. I ate Kinder's food. I mean, I was I all the way, and I don't want people to do that. Yeah. Like, I don't want anybody to have to go to rock bottom. And if you're just willing to be honest with yourself and say, look. I got to make some changes. It'll change will happen. And here's the thing. Like, if you look at, like, you go look at, like, uh, you know, look at the top people in EXP. Cliff Freeman's got an amazing story. Like, he was 50 years old, divorced, living in his mom's house, you know? Right. You know, Jay, Jay Kinder, you know, he was 19, cutting lawns, just having Braden. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. you know, everybody, who, everybody who's a top person, you know, at, at EXP was at a point in their life where they were, what do they say, lower than whale poop? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But they made the decision they were going to not do it. Even you, you were ready to get out of real estate, right? You were done. Yeah, I was done. Right, and you had at, this at some that. point. At some point, I mean, I was still fighting, but it financially didn't make any sense. No, but you still fought through it. You decided Absolutely. you were going to fight. You know, and, and, yeah. and you're, were you married at the time? Yeah. Your wife was looking at you like, you know what, Marino, you better do something because uh, yeah. we're about to, we're about to blow the whistle and tell her to get out of the pool, right? So, yeah. <laughs> right. But but the whole point is, is you you were honest with yourself. You're like, I got to find a better way. Yeah. And that's what it takes. Like that fear is going to be there. You got to decide you're going to walk through it. If you can't walk through it, then you got to go find out what's causing that fear and then say, okay, I'm not going to let fear rule the day anymore. But I promise you when you do, amazing things are going to happen for you. And I'm living proof of that. Right. Right. Living proof of that. 2019, I was 51 years old. And I decided to make the changes in my life that now allow me to help other people do the same thing. And I'm, I just turned 54 in July. And, um, you know, so I'm telling you, if, if you want to do it, you can do it, but it is up to you. So uh, how's the book sales going, man? I mean, you know, it's, it's I'm really blessed. It actually, um, you know, I, I, I did. I initially released it to get some authority and credibility, but right. it ended up being a bestseller in four different categories on uh, on, on, on Amazon. And yeah. uh, I won an award for being, uh, you know, from the National Academy of Bestsellers for it. And um, I've got a couple of things I'm working on to go ahead and start selling more of it. I'm going to record the Audible hopefully another week or two, but yeah, I've been really, really blessed. And it's just, uh, the, the best thing for me is, is I get messages from people that see, Oh my God, I right. felt, I felt like that was my childhood. You were talking about it. Oh, you know, wow. We can talk to them. And that, yeah. that was the whole point is I just, you know what, like just, I want people to have hope. So That's yeah, awesome. appreciate the chance to talk about it. Thank you. Absolutely, man. Really awesome. good job getting that book. Rick. Thank written, you, brother. I, you know what? He, so, I, I didn't, you know, here's the thing. Like I, uh, I've been fortunate enough, I was an English major in college. I've been writing yeah. for 25, yeah. 26 years. I just did not have the time to do it. And so I, I got hooked up with a company who connected me with a woman named Autumn Jade Monroe. Yeah. She, she's my, my co author. And she, I mean, she's, she wrote it. I mean, she, I wrote right. it, but she wrote it. Meaning, no, I know. I, talked, I recorded it. She wrote it. I look back and forth, but she did an amazing right. job. I mean, she did a better job than I ever would. So that's fantastic. What else can I, uh, what else can I do for you today? Anything else I can cover for you or share with you? I think that's about it for this one. All right, brother. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for reaching out to me. And certainly, if you ever need anything for your team, you need me to do some training or whatever, no cost, I'd be happy to hop on the phone or on Zoom and do something for your team if you need help with anything, okay? Sounds awesome. Thank you. All right. Appreciate you, man. Have a good Take one. Take care. See you, brother.